Hey everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Modded Career with me, Oofle Spoofle. In today's episode, we'll be mapping Kerbin's magnetic field, Valentina and Bob Carmen will be returning from our space station, and Dunasat and its little lander friend will be arriving at the planet Duna. Hope you guys enjoy the video. We're going to kick off this episode by launching a small science probe into Kerbin orbit. The point of this mission is to collect science using the Magnometer Boom experiment. This experiment is in the stock game, but it has been given a pretty big revamp by the Kerbalism mod. I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. Since our payload is very light, we don't need a very big or expensive launch vehicle, which is just as well because I'm not completing any contracts by doing this mission. Anyway, we are now in low carbon orbit with exactly one kilometer per second of Delta V. I swear that was intentional. That's great because we have places to go, but where exactly are we going? We're not going to the Mon, we're not going to Minmus, and we're definitely not going to Eve. Yeah, you heard me right. Instead, we'll be using our Delta V to place ourselves into an orbit that can access every part of Kerbin's magnetic field. Kerbalism adds radiation belts to the game. The layout of these belts vary from planet to planet, but in the case of Kerbin, we have an inner belt, an outer belt, and this weird looking tail thing called the magnetopause, but we don't need to worry about that one. Everything that's not part of a belt is part of the magnetosphere. This is important because in the eyes of the magnometer boom experiment, these are all like individual biomes that we can run our experiment in. So to access all of these places, we're going to place ourselves into an elliptical orbit with our periapsis just below the inner belt and our apoapsis just above the outer belt. Nice. Now we can run our experiment in all of the situations and oh, it takes seven days for each situation. Oh well, nothing that a little time warp can't fix. Oh, would you look at that? Valentina and Bob have now been at Kerbin Space Hotel for 30 days now, meaning that we've completed our contract and gotten a fair amount of funds. Anyway, our Kerbals have done their jobs and it's time to return them home. The steps to get them back to Kerbin are pretty simple. Undock from the space station, briefly fire up the engine to perform a short deorbit burn, decouple the service module, then sit back, relax and don't burn up in the atmosphere. Luckily for us, we have a heat shield so that didn't happen. Once we slow down enough, we can deploy our parachute and splash down in the ocean. Okay, remember the fair amount of funds we got before? Well, that's going to come in handy because now we have enough funds to upgrade our tracking station to tier 4. This means that our good friend Dunasat will have a nice high-speed connection to the KSC. In stock KSB, transmission speeds don't matter all too much, but with Kerbalism and Scansat, it's vital to have fast enough connection and enough storage since file sizes can get pretty big, especially with Scansat instruments. Now that we have our fancy new tracking station, it's time to orbit Duna. At the moment, we're on track to miss Duna by 8,500 kilometers. So of course, we're going to make a small correction burn at the ascending node to bring our periapsis down to about 12 kilometers above the South Pole. Why am I placing my periapsis inside the atmosphere? Place your guesses in the comments section. I'll wait. Okay, time's up. If you guessed that I wanted to disintegrate my satellite in the atmosphere going at interplanetary speeds, you'd be right. However, I remembered that I'm doing this for the content and not for personal enjoyment, so I had to fight the urge to sabotage my own mission. Instead, I found another use for my low periapsis and deployed my lander, which I kinda just had lying there. Now we can raise the periapsis on the orbiter, and we have a slight problem. Both the lander and the orbiter are going to reach periapsis at pretty much the same time, and I know I'm really intelligent, but there's no way I can control both of them at the same time. No, instead what we do is we do a small prograde burn with the orbiter, meaning that we'll reach periapsis slightly sooner than the lander. Now we can perform our orbital insertion, then take control of the lander. I told you I'm intelligent. Getting the lander safely onto Duna is pretty simple. You point heat shield first and let the atmosphere do most of the work, then once we're going slow enough we have a couple drogue shoots to slow us down even further. Now if your hardware is so fragile to the point that 10 meters per second is still too fast for you, then we've got a couple liquid fueled engines just for you. And there we go. We've done the impossible. Wait, is it is it really impo- oh yeah, never mind. We've landed on another planet. I don't think anyone said it couldn't be done, but I'm going to act like they did anyway. Now, you might be wondering how exactly this thing is being powered with no solar panels. Solar panels have quite a large footprint and this lander really doesn't have enough space for one. So instead, I'm using a fuel cell. Fuel cells burn hydrogen and oxygen which are stored in small tanks to make water. 
Oh yeah, and also a ton of energy. That's pretty useful. Since hydrogen and oxygen are limited resources, we will eventually run out and won't be able to produce electricity. But that's okay, because by that point we will have collected and transmitted all of the science we can get. 9 times out of 10 I would probably use solar panels, but in the case of a probe that doesn't need power for very long, and that doesn't have much surface area available, fuel cells are the way to go. Great. Let's go and see how the orbiter is doing. Well, surprisingly enough, it doesn't seem to have moved much from where I left it. It's still in an elliptical orbit of Duna. Elliptical orbits like this are great for our science instruments because it allows them to operate over a wide range of situations and biomes. So, we're going to wait until our science experiments have gotten all of the possible data and call it a day. Wait, no, this satellite has more than just the basic science equipment. We also have a couple ScanSat instruments which will allow us to map the surface of Duna. Thing is, they can't really do their job in the current orbit. On board we have two mapping instruments, a radar altimeter and a multispectral scanner. Different instruments have different optimal altitudes, in this case it's 100 and 300 kilometers respectively. Sadly, Dunasat isn't small enough to be in two places at once, so by doing some complex mathematics we can find out that 200 kilometers is the happy medium. So all we need to do now is to get from our elliptical orbit to a circular 200 kilometer orbit, and if you play KSP you should know how this is done. And if you don't play KSP, then, I mean, lucky you. Anyway, now that we are in our desired orbit, all we have to do is wait until we've mapped the entire surface of Duna. This may take some time. And there we have it, complete visual, altimetry, biome, and resource maps of Duna. I'm sure this data will come in handy when we inevitably decide to bring Kerbals here. But for now, I think we've done a grand job. If you enjoyed this video, feel free to use YouTube's next generation like button feature. If you want to see more videos like this, I do believe that YouTube recently added a subscribe button too. In the description, there's a link to my Discord server and a list of all of the mods that I used in this video. Anyway, that's it from me. Thanks for watching and have a great rest of your day.